Tell your neighbor, it's about to get real up in here, up in here. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. If you can make it through this next two weeks, you for real. If you can't, God bless. Maybe you're not there yet. Right? But this next two weeks is where the rubber meets the road of where God is trying to lead his people. So when you sing to a holy God, you're going to see why we sing to a holy God. And so Romans chapter 1 comes with a lot of triggers. And so I hope you're ready. Bring it. Ah, someone has faith. I love that. Thank you. Whoever said that. Come sit in the front. Come help me. I might get lonely up here today, especially next week. I mean, I'm just setting up next week in a way. Romans chapter 1, beginning with verse 18, says this. It says, but God shows his anger. Another word for anger is wrath. From heaven against, can you say that word with me? Against? Against, no, the word after against is? No, no, say it with me. Against? All. I just want to make sure you know all. <laughs> Not some. All. Okay. All right. Which means you. Which means me and the person next to you. Because sometimes you hear a message, you're like, I wish someone was here. No, you're here. <laughs> it's all. We got that established. All sinful, wicked people who, what is that word? Who? Suppress. Say it with me. Who? That's a strong word. We're going to get back to that. We we'll suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can see clearly his invisible qualities, his ex external power and divine nature. So they have no what? They have no? Excuse. God's like, I know you all going to like excuses, but I'm giving you none. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Verse 21, yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they became utter what? Say it like you mean it. It's talking about us. Verse 23, and instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worship idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desire. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. Hello, somebody. Hello, sister. <laughs> Line up in the front, all of y'all who was helping me preach today. <laughs> Verse 25, they traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That is why God abandoned them to, to their shameful desires. Even the woman turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulge in sex with each other. And the man, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. And as a result of this sin, they suffer within themselves the penalty they deserved. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he, God, abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things they should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worse, 
they encourage others to do them too. That is the word of the Lord. Can you say amen? amen. amen. My friends, this was written in the first century. But I don't know about you, it sounds like it was written yesterday. Like the Word of God is eternal. It transcends time and places. Because the Word of God was never the idea of man. This is God's idea. God gave us his Word. And Paul is speaking to, remember, a group of people in a city named Rome in first century. And when you do a little research in history, you understand that everything he's saying here was happening in the society. Every single thing, and also, and to be honest with you, it, some of the stuff I can't even share with you is so disgusting. Starting from the top down in that society, the, the emperor of Rome was bisexual. And it was normal for them to castrate kids and make them their spouse. So this, what Paul is talking about is extremely countercultural. And what's fascinating is here we are 21st century later, there's nothing new under the sun. We're just more sophisticated. Now we got apps to hide our sins. Now we can be in church, but our apps are full of this stuff. So there's nothing new under the sun. Everything Paul is sharing here was happening, and everything is still happening. We just have, we call it evolution, but it's really devolution. So this is the reality. He's painting, understand this, what he's doing here. We're coming out of Romans 1.16. Remember, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but it's the power of salvation for those who believe. Like, he's painting a picture. Listen, it's, it's so dark out there that you need the gospel. And in case you don't understand why you need the gospel, let me paint the bleak picture, picture of humanity, of reality, of life without God. So he's taking his time here to say, look, it's worse than you think. Because it's not just society. The reality of a sinful nature is in you. That's why he says all. Later on in Romans 3, he says, all fall short of the glory of God. Every single one of us. We need God's righteousness. So Paul is painting a picture. Look at how unrighteous we are and how desperately we need the righteousness of God. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. God needs to bring that righteousness to you. Are you tracking with me so far? We struggle with the idea of wrath because we don't want God to bring wrath. So we rather say God is love. But the reality is when you study the Bible, God is actually many things, and one of them is God is holy. And over 600 times in the Bible, it says God is a holy, righteous God. More than he says that God is love. So God's wrath is only right because he is the only righteous one. And the funny thing is, we don't like God's wrath, but we do have wrath. It's funny because we don't want anger, but we, we, we reflect anger all the time. Some of y'all today on the way to church, someone took two seconds extra on the green light, and you're like, eh, get out of the way. I'm trying to go to church. <laughs> and, then you, and then you pass them, and you make some Bless your gestures. I hope you don't have a new life sticker on your car. Because <laughs> right. the truth is, we all want justice. We just don't want it to be done on us. And our justice is imperfect because we're imperfect. So God's wrath makes a lot of sense when you understand how bad we are. Matter of fact, you don't appreciate the gospel unless you understand the wrath. Pastor Keller, man, one of my favorite theologians that I go to when I'm studying a lot, he put it this way. Go ahead and put up that quote from Keller. He said, look, if you don't understand or believe in the wrath of God, the gospel will not thrill, empower, or move you. Like, it's only good news because you understand how bad we are. Like, unless you understand how bad, how sinful, how wicked, how wretched we are, you won't understand how amazing the grace of God is. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a 
wretch like me. That's why in, in worship, you see some people, man, they, they're really into it, man. They express their worship. And some people are like, why they get all like that? Well, if you understood what they understood about their wretchedness, you would be worshiping God the way they're worshiping God. <laughs> Jesus even told some religious people that because a woman was worshiping him. And, and they were like, ew, what's he doing? Like, what's she doing? What, what's wrong with her? And Jesus was like, if you knew that much is forgiven, much will you be worshiped, then you will be on your face with her worshiping me for the fact that I am the only righteous one. Unless you understand the wrath of God, you won't appreciate the grace of God. John Newton wrote that because he understood the grace of God. God found him in his wretchedness. The man used to be a slave owner. And he met God and he wrote amazing grace. How sweet the sound. And, and centuries later, it still resonates. Why? Because it reflects the reality that, man, we, should, we deserve wrath, but God is so good, he gives us grace. That's the picture that Paul is picturing here, that God's wrath or anger is revealed. Notice he said it's being revealed, not it will be revealed. It's happening as we speak. And he says it happens for two reasons. If you're taking notes, he says it happens because of, of sinfulness or godlessness, right? And then it happens because of wickedness. That's important. He says the first part, the sinfulness part is saying is because you have destroyed the vertical relationship you have with him. He says because you destroyed the greatest commandment, which is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And what happens when you don't have the vertical right? You get the horizontal wrong. He's saying because you're not loving God, you're not putting him in his rightful place in your lives, then you're destroying everything around you. It's the opposite of the two greatest commandments, to love God and to love people. It's impossible to come to this church without hearing those two things, right? Love God, love people. And Paul is saying the wrath of God is here because we do the opposite. We don't love God and we have a hard time loving each other. Because he says love your neighbor as you love your? It's hard to love yourself well when you don't love God well. It's hard to love yourself well if you don't love God well. And then it's hard to love others well if you don't love God well. So he's saying, listen, the opposite of loving God and loving people is the reason why the wrath of God is being poured out. And he says, we, he says the reason why is because you know better, but you suppress the truth. He says, you know better, but you decide to, su this word suppress, please write this down because it's a very important word. The word suppress means you're preventing someone from exercising power. In other words, you're taking the power away from God and you're giving it to yourself. You decided, I want my way so bad that I'm willing to suppress everything that God has already said for me to get my way. Let me put it another way. Pastor Mark Driscoll put it this way. He said, he said imagine... You see a fight. One side is truth, the other side is lie. They're about to fight. And you decided, I'm gonna jump in with lie. And then we're gonna gang up on truth. And we're gonna beat up truth. And we're gonna choke truth until we kill truth because we want lie to reign over truth. He said, that's what every single human being has done with God's truth. We've suppressed it. We choked it out because we want the lie to rule over the truth of God. We take in the power of God and said, we'll take it because we know better than God. Matter of fact, we want to be our own God. And the way we do that now is we create hashtag movements. We create parades. And we go out on the masses and we tell everybody, we're all into this together. If you're not with us, you must be homophobic. You, you, you must be regressive. You must be old-fashioned. You must be cynical. You, you must be one of those Bible people people. Like, if you're not with the masses, then you're not with the lie. And Paul stands up in the middle of Rome and declares the truth of God. He says, no. The Bible says, let every man be a liar and let God be true. 
We all have a choice to make today and this next week. You're either going to live by the world or you're going to live by the word. There comes a time in life where God draws a line in the sand and says, pick. Because you can't toe the line on this one. You're either with the masses or you're with the word. You either gang up on truth and suppress it and choke it out or you embrace the truth for what it is. See, he says, you have no excuses because God has revealed himself. Paul says there's two ways here that God has, re- has given us what we call general revelation. Everybody on the face of the planet has general revelation. Number one, he says, God revealed himself through creation. He says creation points to the reality that there's a creator, that we didn't get here by ourselves. We didn't just conjure up all of this. Creation shows the glory of God. Go go home and look up Psalm 19. The glory of God is being manifested over creation. The Bible says that every day God raises the sun to show us his glory, to show us his goodness, that we cannot live and exist without the sun, that we're codependent on a creator, whether we like it or not. We're all on life support. But here we are going, I do my own thing. But if God calls it, you're done. Like every breath you take, I don't know if you realize this, the word breath means pneuma. The word pneuma is spirit. In other words, every time you're breathing, whether you like it or not, you're saying, I depend on God. I'll depend on the spirit. Everybody who is alive on the face of the planet is because God's breathing life over them. Every single person. Even the atheist is saying God without wanting to say God because you're breathing. You're saying spirit every single day. And what do we say when someone dies? The spirit left them. They give up breathing. Because creation says, you're alive because you have a creator. Your body, man, your body tells you about God. Your body is amazing. Psalm 139 says, I was fearfully, wonderfully made. Some of y'all were fearfully made. Some of y'all are wonderfully made. But your body, man, your body is amazing. It's so complex. Right now, as we speak, your body's working on your, on your behalf. Your body's creating cells. Your body's re- regenerating cells. Cells are dying. Cells are being resurrected. The reality of resurrection is happening in your body all the time. It's like God is trying to speak to you through your creation, through his creation. Everything around you. Man, have you ever been mesmerized by a sunset? And he points to something bigger than you. You ever go to the ocean and find yourself be so small? Because you're like, wow, what's all this? I was just on a plane, man. I looked down and I'm like, this is, this is incredible. And, and, and how can people go, huh, I, I got this. I made this. It's laughable. I was here Friday night talking to the young people about this. And, and, and next week I'll... I'll add more to this because I, I wanted to give them a picture of biblical sexuality because obviously their schools are lying to them. But I was telling them, like, let me, I mean, isn't it a fascinating that, that you don't even have a choice to be born? Someone gave birth to you. Like you didn't come up with that idea to give birth to yourself. Like you didn't go put a deposit on your birth. Hey, you never had it say. It's not like, hey, I want to be born. Do I have the right to be born? Someone had to give you birth. And you have been depending on people and God every single day. In your womb, you have to depend on your mother. Because God, in a way, blows my mind, created your mother's body to be able to sustain you in there. You had no say, but you were fed, you were nourished, and then one day, it came time for you to come out. You didn't come up with that. (laughs) It was all design, and then you came out. You had no idea where you were. Someone had to spank you to make you cry. (laughs) Make sure you're alive. And now here you are going, I can do my own thing. You would never be able to do your own thing. It's crazy. 
I was telling them, I said, you know what crazy that is? Like, here you are now, 14, 15 years old, talking about, mom, you don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) The same mother who nourished you, who carried you, who now has stretch marks because of you, (laughs) who stayed up all night with you, who changed your stinking diaper, who fed you, who clothed you, paid for gymnastics, paid for school, the same mom doesn't know what she's doing now. How dare you? How dare you, you little human? You deserve wrath. You deserve wrath. Talking about I know what I'm doing. Held your hand, nursed you, had a fever, hold you. Because God created your mom. And now you're dissing your mom. You deserve wrath. You deserve wrath. Not just creation points to God, but he says, he says your conscience points to God. When we get to chapter 2, he says, every human being has this, this, this moral code built on the inside of us. I call it our GPS system. God wired us to know right from wrong. God put that in us already. Like every, talking about kids, isn't it amazing how kids become the greatest lawyers on the face of the planet? How is it that a two-year-old is discussing ice cream with you? Here's the thing, Ma. It's like, who taught you how to do that? You have a GPS built-in system in you, and what we do as human beings is, is the reality, right? The built is there. Just like this, this place has an alarm system. When you guys leave, we'll put the alarm system in, and if something happens, it goes off, and then we can come and bypass it. The problem with us humans is the alarm goes off and says, wrong, 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 and we go, bypass, 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 bypass. I want to do my own thing. Bypass, bypass. Don't you lie in church. We do it all the time. The alarm is there, and we go, bypass it. I want what I want. But you can't escape your conscience. You see why he says your your mind goes dark and confused? You know why mental health is such an issue in our society? Bypass, 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 bypass. Now you're like, I don't even know anymore. Because you bypass the moral code that God built on the inside. My friends, this is countercultural. This goes against the grain of everything our society stands for right now. I don't even know if this message will make YouTube by the time I'm done, especially next week. Hello. Because <laughs> no one wants the truth. We want to suppress the truth. See, it's so messed up that now lie says you're the, you're the repressor. Lie says, you're the regressive one. You're the old-fashioned one. You're the homophobic. You're the hater. Because lie is on the side of the masses. Because most people want to do their own thing and call it truth. So now we have a name for it. We call it my truth. My reality. But here's the thing with truth. Truth does not have an expiration date. Like, we have a food pantry. We got to check the food once in a while to make sure it's, it's still good. But this was written 21 centuries ago, and it's still very relevant today because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Truth does not expire. So Paul says, actually, Paul goes, hey, let me actually show you that you're the one that's repressive. You're the one that's repressing the truth. So if anyone is repressive, it's you who stand on the side of lies. Man, I love Paul, man. He, that dude is savage. Standing in front of Rome. And guess, guess what? He pays with his price because of this. He pays with his life. I don't know if you're paying attention. I don't want to alarm anyone. But we're going to a place where it's going to become harder and harder to be people of truth. And you're going to have to make a decision. Do I blend in or do I stay true to who God created me to be? No matter what comes, come hell or high water, I'm going to stay on the side of truth. Because here's the thing. Self-suppression is living in denial of the truth. And here's, 
what we're dealing with, if I can make it practical, it's, it's either we're dealing with truth and untruth. In a way, we're dealing with reality and fantasies. But because lie is, is of the masses, then it sounds like it makes sense. Now, let me get in trouble for a little bit here. So I say to you today, my friends, I've decided that I am Chinese, I'm 6'5", <laughs> and I'm a woman. You would say, Pastor, you went on vacation and lost your mind. <laughs> but if I say, okay, 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 I'm not Chinese, I'm not 6'5", but I am a woman. You would say, oh, that's your truth. To which I say, okay, then, can't wait to see me and your little girls in the bathroom. To which you say, well, not my kids. Wait, I am a woman. After all, I say I am. That's my truth. What's that got to do with you? Problem is, here's the thing with truth. None of us live in an island. Sooner or later, my truth is going to clash with your truth. My reality is going to clash with your reality. If my kids go to your school and they're teaching them that there's no such thing as male and female, we've got a problem because I do believe there's a male and a female. And I don't want you teaching my kids about sexuality. Teach them about math. Let me take care of the sexuality. Because here's why I don't want you teaching my kids about sexuality. You, you barely have a handle on your own sexuality. Oh, we're doing good then. Yes, <laughs> we got this thing going on right now. We just don't like what God says. We don't. Let's be real. So we got this thing going on right now. I don't know if you're paying attention, parents especially. It's called critical theory. Well, it's basically another version of suppressing the truth. It's like I'm going to take power from here to give it to here. So what's, what's happening, I don't know if you're understanding, slowly parents are losing power. Yeah. Teachers are losing power. Police is losing power. Yeah. All the authority that God put in place is being replaced by something less than so that everyone could do whatever the heck they want to do. And the worst thing about life is to do exactly what you want to do. Because you know how much our kids need structure if they're going to make it. They need structure if they're going to thrive. Some of us are living in chaos today as adults because we never had structures as kids. So we don't like what God says. So we're going to dismantle the system and transfer power to someone else so we can get our way. See, society is exchanging God's truth for the lie of the masses prefer. Next week, I'll get into the religion of sex, because it, it is a religion. How much sex has become such a religion that if, if I say anything against it, then, then I'm coming against your identity. Which is so interesting, right? We don't have parades for every kind of sin. Like, I've never met a drug addict going... I used to be a cocaine addict, now I'm a cocaine Christian. Let's have cocaine parades. I used to be a gossiper. No, I'm not one anymore, but I'm a gossiper Christian. No one identifies themselves by their sin. Oh. I used to kill people. I was a murderer. Now I'm a murderer of Christians. Now let's have murdering Christian parades. I used to be a pedophile. Now I'm a pedophile Christian. So let's have pedophile parades. Let's show everybody why they shouldn't hire us. I don't know if I'll make YouTube. But I'll get into more of that next week. We, see, we claim to be independent. This is the thing. But it's an illusion. It's all an illusion to say, I want to do whatever I want to do. It's calling the shots. It's me deciding what's right and wrong. 
and overruling my conscience in the process. That's the reality we're facing. And it's not just some people. Please get me. It's all of us. We all have done it. At one point or another, we all have done it to appease our own selves. See, the worst thing about life is to do whatever you want to do. Sometimes that's what you need to realize you are your worst enemy. You are your worst God. We replace God to worship something else. That's why Paul says they are ungrateful because how can you be dependent on somebody else and then cuss them out? We depend on God and we just throw our fists at him. We depend on parents, we throw our fists at them. We depend on police, now we say defund the police. Someone come rob in your house. You need an ambulance. But worship, see, please get this. Everybody worships, this is the problem. See, people think, oh, I'm not into religion, I'm not, that's not my thing. Well, you worship something. We all do. If you take your notes, man, worship is, is what gets your devotion, your attention, and your energy. Everybody has something that gets their devotion, their attention, and their energy. Every single person on the face of the planet, I don't care who you are, there's stuff that makes you wake up in the morning. If you're wondering what is worship, is that thing. I don't know if you notice how he said, he goes, he goes they, they replace God, right, for what? For idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. I thought that was funny. Because in our society, like, different animals represent the different things. And I thought that was funny because every Sunday now in America, we worship the cardinals, the bears. We worship, <laughs> we create stadiums to go and worship people running after a stupid ball. <laughs> they call it football, but they barely use their foot. And we paint our faces, and we worship, and we cheer, and we wear our favorite God's jersey, and we celebrate, and then we go home empty, especially when they lose. <laughs> we worship every Sunday. Every single Sunday, people are worshiping. There are parents not in church today because they're little men who's not going to make it ever to the NBA, <laughs> but they got to take him to basketball. I got news for you. Jimmy ain't making it. You're wasting time, you're wasting your worship on idols. Whatever we, see, here's the thing. Whatever you worship, you also serve. Whatever you worship, you serve. It takes your time, it takes your talent, it takes your treasure. People are like, oh, I don't worship. Show me your bank account. I'll show you where you worship. Some of y'all, man, you love the God of Dunkin' Donuts. You're like, give me that coffee every day. <laughs> Some of y'all are like, no, my God is a little bit more upgraded. I like Starbucks. <laughs> yeah, I, listen, people that worship a Starbucks so bad that they speak in tongues over there. <laughs> you ever heard of Starbucks order? I'm like, I'm speaking in tongues. Yo, give me a double latte with frappuccino, with, with, with caramel on the side, with a little bit of, you know, sprinkled dust so I can have a good day. I was at Starbucks the other day, my wife was like, why are you nervous? Because I'm like, I don't know what to say. <laughs> right? She's like, why are you nervous? I'm like, ah, is it a tall, a grande? I don't know. I just want some coffee. <laughs> people say church has their own language. Coffee people got their own language. <laughs> you ever talk to people who worship fantasy football? They got their own language. Let's talk about stuff, double coverage, triple threat. What? <laughs> I thought we were just watching football. Whatever you worship takes your time, your talent, and your treasure. Some of y'all, man, you love the God of Amazon. Some of y'all never go home without some type of box. Ah! It came. It's here. Hallelujah. Everybody worships. Interesting thing about worship is you, it's a good thing you turn into an idol. None of these things are bad. They're all good. Your family is amazing. But guess what? Who gave you your family? 
I've seen people pray for kids, kids come, and now kids have all their time, all their energy. They can't make it to church, they can't serve, they can't do anything else. Why? Because little Johnny now, I worship you, Johnny. What do you want to do? What do you want to do? You got to take a nap? Okay, we can't go to church. You got to take a nap, Johnny. That's worship. People can't serve anybody else. I, I, listen, I got enough. Me, and myself, and my family, we're good. That's worship. If everything God trusted you with to be a blessing, you turn it into worship. How about career? It's my career. I can't mess my career. Whatever happens, I need to have my career. Don't mess up with my career. I give my career all the time and attention in the world. Some people's money. That's why some people, you're like, let's give. Oh, let's give. <laughs> my money. <laughs> Even your money touched to tell you to worship God. Yeah. If you had a devotion with your money lately, take it out. Read it. What does it say? Even your money. Isn't that funny? Ministry can become a God. Sometimes I'll talk to people, they see me do this, and they're like, how do I do this? It's like, why though? Is it to get a platform or is it to help people? Because I've seen a lot of pastors do a lot of dumb stuff because they lost the sight of God and made it about themselves. And now they gave everybody a black eye with their dumb moves that they're making because they didn't know why they gave in a platform in the first place. Anything can become an idol. Good things. We turn our backs on God. And that's why Paul says, look, Romans 1, says this, we claim to be wise, instead we become fools. Because when you hear people talk, man, this sounds amazing. Everybody seems to know everything. By the way, everybody now is an expert of everything. No matter what you bring up, oh, I know. It's amazing. People are experts in politics, in theology, even the medical field. Girl, you know what you need to do with that? <laughs> WMD said. Fools. You know what the word fool in the Bible means? It means like you looked at all the evidence about God and you said, nah, I'm good. I do my own thing. Nah, that's crazy. That's regressive. That's old fashioned. I know what I'm doing. I have an Instagram page. Oh, man, it's, it's, it's so funny to hear people talk. And you know where you find the biggest fools? In the place where wisdom should prevail. In education. You want to hear the biggest nonsense in the world? Go to a college or university right now. And hear this professor spew knowledge. And the Bible says knowledge puffs up. Because it's all self-made. And, and you guys who are in college, they'll rip this thing apart, man. This is their favorite thing to rip. You know what's, what, 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 what fascinates me about that? Man, why are you so fascinated with something you don't believe in? I think it bothers you. I think the alarm system is going off. I think the alarm system is going off. Because listen, if it's not real, then why are, you, why are you worried? Sometimes people are like, God's not real. I'm like, then why are you stressed? <laughs> the Bible's not real. Then why are you mad? I think it bothers you. I think deep down inside, you're trying to overrule the code. But here's what I want to tell you, college students. Don't just listen to what they say. Look at their lives. See, I don't never listen to what people say. I have to check, does your life back up what you're saying? Because Jesus said it's not what you say, it's your fruits. So I want to ask these professors who know better than God, hey, how's your life going? Not the life you're presenting in front of us, but the life when you go home. Because everybody shows you their highlights on Instagram, but I, how, how's your low light? What's good when it's time to go to bed? Because nothing reveals about what's really going on with you when you can't sleep. So don't just listen to people at face value, because it's deeper than that. It's foolishness. If there's no God, right, think about this, right? Here's a couple of exercises. If there's no God, who has the right to say what's right and wrong? If there's no moral giver, no moral code, then who are you to tell me what's right and what's wrong? 
If there's no more absolutes, it's only arrogance that says, because I say so. Yeah, but who are you, though? And here's another one. Here's another argument. Well, if God's good, then why all the evil in the world? But then no one ever asks you, if God's good, then why all the goodness in the world? Because if all we are is, is animals and we evolved and survival of, the fittest, survival of the fittest is real, then there shouldn't be no goodness. But we're always fascinated when a human goes out of their way to do something really good. We're always inspired. Why? Because I think it inspires the God conscious in all of us to do the right thing. So you got to ask these questions. It's interesting because the masses are not always right. Think about this practically. About 50 years ago, this country was segregated. That's not a long time. 50 years is not, some of y'all are 50 years old. That's not a long time where this country decided, hey, Negroes are less than. You talking about bathrooms? You couldn't go to the same bathroom as a white person. How crazy is that? And this was the rule of the law. Like, this was how it was. Jim Crow, segregation. You can't even go to the same school 50 years ago. And who said that was wrong? People who read this thing and says, no, people are made in the image and likeness of God. This ain't right. <laughs> so listen, this is why the masses are not always right. The majority is not always right. Go read your Bibles. God is the God of the minority. He always picks the minority to make a point. So that's why Paul says, look, verse 124, go ahead. He says, so God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desire. Scariest probably verse in the Bible for me. See, God's wrath, everybody's thinking one day God's going to pour out his judgment. No, no, it's already happening. That's the wrath of God is to say, okay, then do whatever you want to do. Hands off. That's the scariest thing in the world. When God takes his hand off of your life. Because when God takes his hand off, you're left with everything that's opposite of him. When God says, hey, hey do whatever you want, he's saying this. He's saying, hey, I'm taking my love. You're left with your lust. I'm taking my peace. You're left with your chaos. I'm taking my blessings. You're left with your destructions. Like, uh, hands off. Do your thing. See, people are waiting. The enemy said, you're not going to die. God's like, all right, then. And everything went to hell. Yeah. Worst thing a guy can do is take his hands off of us. Remember as a kid, I don't know about you, I'd rather got the spanking than the silent treatment. Because oh, yeah. the spanking, I knew where we stood. You got it out of the way, Mom, we're good. <laughs> but the silent treatment, wait till your father gets home? It's only 9 o'clock. Oh, my. I got to wait for hours. And, and now, like, your mind goes crazy. You're trying to figure out what's going to happen. Dark and confused. You're crazy in your own head because you're like, yo. Those words are scary. Scary for God to say, then do your thing. God takes his hand off. We get the reverse of everything that he had in mind for us. We become slaves to what we serve. We become unsatisfied. Here's, here's the reality. No one wants to talk about this, but the truth is this. We become unsatisfied, always needing more. Because when God takes his hand off, now it's like, how do I get that peace? How do I become happy? How do I become joyful? Like, what's the biggest thing people are looking for? I just want to be happy. And what do we do to be happy? We do more of the thing we think is going to make us happy. We're so unsatisfied, we have a society full of addicts. We're addicted to drugs, we're addicted to sex, we're addicted to work. You know why people are a workaholic? Because they can't stop to think. 
scary when you're left with your own thoughts. So I'd rather work 80 hours a week and not even face myself. Some people jump into a relationship, it goes, it goes left on them, they jump into another one. Why? I, I can't bear to be by myself. Like, I don't know what to do with myself. And then it's career, and then it's money. It's like, oh, like, this is going to be the thing. This is going to be the thing. That's, that's humanity's cycle. This is going to be the thing. This is going to be the thing. Like, this job is going to be the thing, man. This thing is going to be the thing. And some people, it's even, it's even religion. Oh, this church is going to be the thing. And then, and then honeymoon season fades. Because God's like, hey, you can even do religion on your own, you know that. We become unsatisfied, always needing more, become addicts. Tim Keller, again, one of my favorite pastors, put it this way. He said, go ahead. He said, the tragedy of humanity is that we strive for and fail to find what we could simply receive and enjoy. We suppress the truth which would free us and satisfy us. In other words, we are our worst enemy. Because we're kicking and screaming against the very thing that wants to help us enjoy those things we're looking for. Right. You know the U2 song? I still haven't found what I'm looking for. But we, 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 we believe the next thing is going to be the thing. See, here's, this is a hard one to teach. I hope you catch this. When he says sinful desires, when, he, when the Bible talks about lust, he's saying it's an over-desire that becomes all-controlling. It drives you. So you know what the problem of humanity is? We have an over-desire for good things. Not bad things. Good things. That's our struggle. We turn good things into gods. And we end up with false worship. See, the worst thing that can happen to any of us is to get exactly what we wanted. See, when your career becomes your God, a promotion is the worst thing that can happen to you. Because here you go again. This is it. This is the thing. And then we check on you six months later. Now you hate your job. The very thing you pray for, you start to hate. The marriage you prayed for, now is like, I can't stand him. <laughs> because you turn him into a worship. The kids you pray for, now we're driving you nuts. The ministry you wanted so bad, you want the platform, it comes with responsibilities. <laughs> now you're like, that's not what I had in mind, God. Why have you forsaken me? <laughs> the wrath of God is to give you exactly what you want. To give you over to your pursuit of things that you've placed in front of him. Keller goes on to say this. This blew my mind. He said, God will let you reach your idolatrous goals. Wow. God's like, hey, go ahead, go ahead, do your thing. What's, what's the latest? Hashtag killing it. <laughs> All the highlights. But what's the price you're paying for that highlight? How many pills you had to pop to get up this morning? Hashtag rise and grind. But unsatisfied. Always wanting something else. In church, but your mind is dark and confused. Let me end this. Romans 1.25 says, they traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the created himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That's our struggle. Until we get to this place of realizing only the creator is worthy of praise. Why do we start every Sunday with praise and thanksgiving? Do you know why? So once again, we can align ourselves with our Creator. It's a weekly reminder, you're not God. You need a God. You're not it. So every week, man, but if you're not into Him, then you're not into worship. 
But man, when you understand it, you're like, I can't wait to be in his presence to be reminded again so that my, li- my whole life can be aligned again for the week. That I am nothing without my creator. So worship team, you can come. Look, basically, let me, let me end this with truth. Truth, not lie. Only the creator is worthy of praise. We must accept God's right to rule over us. That we're not God, but we do have a God. We do have a creator. See, next week we'll get into the next part of this where he gets into the religion of sex, how we've made sex such a thing. You know what the challenge is going to be? Can God tell you who you can't or cannot sleep with? Do you want to know if you're a real disciple of Jesus? Does Jesus have all of you or does he just have your stomach up? Is Jesus the Lord of your pants? Or is it God? You got it up here and I got the rest. Because he created you as a sexual being. So that means even that has a plan and a purpose. It's my body, my choice. It's funny, everybody who goes to an abortion rally has already been born. Someone gave me life. Now I'm going to tell you, you can take it away. And what, we do, how do, what's the justification? My body, my choice. Thank God someone didn't think that about you. Wow. And what's the justification? Well, well what, if it's, what if it's incest? Or what if the woman uh, mom is in trouble? And the reality is if you, if you do the homework, that's like 0.00.1% of the time. 99.9% of the time is convenience. And God says, okay. But here's what they don't tell you. Because I've had conversations with women who've had an abortion. And they're depressed. And they're hurting. And they're struggling. Because they know, man, I can never get that back. But God's faithful to forgive and to restore you and to bless you. (laughs) Consequences of sin, man, it's not good. I've seen people go into depression because they made that decision. We must repent from suppressing the truth because everything around you, listen, you think we preach? We preach once a week. The world preaches every day. You're going to live here, you're going to be preached too. I'm going to go home and watch a basketball game with my kids. I can't stand it anymore because every commercial is trying to tell them something that I'm trying to teach them not to do. Every single commercial. So now I gotta pause commercials. I gotta change the channel. Because you decided to suppress the truth. And when you suppress the truth, we all pay for it. We must desire God more than anything He created. If we don't get to that place, man, you don't get to the gospel. That's the gospel. See, what blows my mind about the gospel is Paul was making a point here. He's like, listen. We're so bad that Jesus had to take the wrath for us. That's why we worship him. I just had family devotion with our kids. I was trying to help them understand what is substitutionary death. I said, you know how we play basketball and sometimes the subs, someone gets tired, you replace them. Jesus like, Father, I'll take it. You're a holy, just God. Let me take the wrath for them. Let me show them how much you love them. That's the gospel. In Jesus, you are loved. You are accepted. When you surrender, when you yield to his will, when you say, Lord, I want you to be my Lord and Savior, I, it's a choice. This whole sexuality thing is a choice. Even in your struggle with sexuality, you can surrender. It's a choice. Lord, I... I realize that I'm a wretched sinner, but I need your amazing grace. I need you to forgive me. I need you to empower me. I need you to help me live in freedom 
of true praise, of true worship. And lastly, how do you know you have understood and received the gospel? When the thing we are most looking forward to in eternity is praising him forever. That's when you know that I just want to be where you are. I just want to be near your heart. There's nothing I want more. Everything else in my life, Lord, is a bonus of what you've blessed me with. I'm able to enjoy my family because Jesus is first. I'm able to raise my kids because Jesus is first. I'm able to lead this church with everything it comes with because Jesus is first. I want to be where you are. I want to be where you are. That's the gospel. I want to be one with Jesus. Let's stand together and pray. This is one of those messages you're either with the world or you're with the word. There's crossroads in life we're all going to come to, and we're going to have to make a decision. Do I keep doing what I'm doing, or do I surrender? Because God's word is eternal. Truth doesn't expire. Jesus is still the way. He's still the truth. He's still the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. He's the way to salvation. I will never be able to save myself. I can do a lot of great things in life, but I can't save myself. I'm trying to explain that to our kids this week about what does it mean to be saved by grace because it's like, man, ev- the whole system of life is you got to earn it. From very small, we, we, we have thought to earn things. Like you go to kindergarten, you got to earn a sticker. You go to first grade, you got to earn your grades. You, you got to make the basketball team, you got to try out and make the team. You got to have a resume to get the job. Like everything is, you got to earn it. You got to earn it. And God's like, I'm going to give you the thing that you need the most though, you can't earn. Which is my gift of salvation. But when you, when you understand that, then all these other things you got to earn takes its rightful place. They don't become idols. They become blessings. That's the gospel. And today we have the privilege of making Jesus Christ the Lord of our lives. So I want to pray. And let the Holy Spirit have his way. Father, we come to this place in in our service where we need to make a decision to surrender. I pray, help us. Lord, sometimes we need your help because it's not even, we don't even, we can even do it. We can even surrender, Lord. We need you to help us. Please take from us our lives when we don't have the strength to give it to you. The things we hold on to so tightly, not realizing they're just killing us slowly. Help us to release control today. Help us to release the illusion that we are in control and really come into your will and your purpose. We want to be where you are. So Holy Spirit, minister to each one of us as only you can.